Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg problem, which is super cool. We're, we're getting back into graph theory, which I think I've talked about this a lot. It's my favorite subject. I love it so much. So I, I, I hope this is, you know, I hope this is a good lecture for y'all, like uh, just a good video in general. So the background for this problem is actually super cool. It's, it's actually uh, part, it's the first, basically, what I love about this is that it's the first graph theory problem, and it's applied. It's applied to an actual uh, real-life thing that was uh, worrying people at the time. Uh, not a very important real-life thing that was worrying them, but, you know, a very real-life thing as, as is. So, yeah, this is what the problem is. So, back in Konigsberg, Prussia, in, oh, I forget the year. I think it was sometime in the 1700s, so I'll have to double-check that later. But basically, the city kind of looked like this. So there are four land masses, like so, and seven bridges connecting those land masses in various ways. So uh, they, those bridges cross a river, which I tried to uh, do in blue there, and the bridges I tried to do, I tried to do them in uh, green. So what people tried to do, because they didn't really have, you know, any sort of entertainment back then. There certainly wasn't any Netflix or anything was they would try to um, basically cross all of these bridges in one route without taking any bridge twice. So, you know, people might start here, try to cross this bridge, cross this bridge, maybe cross down here and here and here and then back here. But then they didn't hit this bridge at all, which is a problem because they want to hit all of the bridges. The whole thing about not wanting to cross each bridge twice, I guess, you know, they want unique scenery or something like that, but they're still walking over all the bridges every day or something like that. I don't know. Uh, rich people back in Prussia were really weird, I guess. And ideally, what they would have preferred, I'm sure, is to be able to start and end on the same island. So this was a huge, a hugely debated topic. A lot of people were writing entries, like journal entries, on why they thought it was possible or why they didn't think it was possible, but no one could conclusively find a solution to this problem. Until someone named Leonard Euler came around. Uh, Euler is pretty much the father of graph theory. He's the person who took this problem and created the entire field of graph theory. So he, he decided, I guess he must have gotten tired of all the quarreling or something, you know, people, maybe people are making too much noise outside of his window and he just wanted to do, I don't know, math or whatever. He was kind of a nerd back then. But it's, it's, it's understandable he did create graph theory, so we can excuse him for this, I'm sure. Anyway, so what he did was he decided he would try to mathematically tackle this problem. Basically prove that it was not possible with actual mathematical rigor so that, you know... Actually, so that you could conclusively say, hey, this is not true, here are the reasons why, and nobody could argue against that. So, that's what he went about doing. And when he was looking at this problem, what he realized is that, okay, well, it doesn't really matter things like how large the landmasses are, or what shape they are, or even where they are in relation to each other. It doesn't matter how long the bridges are, or if they're completely straight or curved a little bit, anything like that. None of that matters. All that matters is that the land masses are connected and, you know, wh wh which land masses are connected, which land masses are not connected. That's the most important part of this question. So what he did was he started redrawing this picture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to label the vertices first, or what will become the vertices, so these land masses here. So this becomes, let's call this V1. Call this V2, V3, and V4. And I'll draw them like this. Give us uh, plenty of space to work with. So I'll draw them here. Let's say this is V1, V2, V3, and V4. And next, he's, uh, he's going to define the edges. So what he did was he said, okay, well, there's two bridges between V1 and V2, so I'll just draw two lines here between V1 and V2. There's two bridges between V2 and V3, so he drew these two lines here. There's one 
bridge from this line mass to this line mass, so that's an edge from V1 to V4. One from uh, V3 to V4 here, so he drew an edge like this. And then he drew one less edge like this, representing this bridge here. So just like that, this, this is the first graph that was ever made. Uh, and it's super cool that this was, uh, really, it was very recently in the scope of mathematics. Graph theory is a very new field, and already it's shown itself to be super powerful. I mean, if the first thing your mathematic, your new mathematical field does is quell, like, super intense debate that was probably happening for decades, you know it's going to be, it's off to a good start already. So, yeah, this was the first graph ever, and I presented this, I believe, in the first homework as, or I did the, the f maybe not the first homework, but the, uh, I think that one of the early quizzes, I presented this graph, and yeah, I did it for a reason. It's a very cool and important graph. It's, it's uh, iconic. You know, my advisor, Teresa Migler, she actually has a, uh, a very old map of Konigsberg. Uh, um, unfortunately, today, most of these bridges are now gone. I think it's uh, five bridges or something like that, four or something. But most of these bridges are gone. The land masses have been changed, all that kind of stuff. You know, Prussia was absorbed into the Soviet Union. All kinds of stuff historically happened. So you can't reenact this problem anymore. But the impact of this problem is still felt in modern-day mathematics. But yeah, my advisor, she has a map of Konigsberg which is super cool, like old Koenigsberg, which is super cool to look at, so you can actually see the original bridges. So um, if you ever are in her office hours for whatever reason, I highly recommend taking a look at that map. It's, it's fantastic. But yes, what Euler wanted to do was he was saying, okay, let's pretend we're starting on, we're, we're standing on one of these vertices, and we want to find some sort of path. We want to walk around on these vertices by following edges such that once we start walking on an edge, we complete walking on that edge. So we don't go halfway and then back. No, we, we want to follow every edge to another vertex. And what we want to do is we don't want to walk along the same edge twice. So with this problem, he uh, he he created a lot of a lot of uh, I, I guess you could call them concepts that we find super familiar to graph theory nowadays, and I'm going to really go through them uh, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, just as a heads up, this video goes into a lot of detail about a lot of things. We're going to introduce a ton of definitions all at once, so please pause this video frequently. Um, keep a list of all these definitions, and because some of these definitions uh, depend on other definitions, I highly recommend like writing some kind of family tree or something like that of these definitions, so you can see the relationships. Because we'll be building using definitions to create other definitions to create other definitions, and so on. So it's worth taking this video slowly and keeping track of how everything is related to each other. All right, so um, please ignore the shift in resolution. I don't know why I spent a good hour trying to figure out why my camera decided to do that. No avail. So I apologize for the inconsistency. Uh, I guess we're just in old-timey 4x3 mode now. So anyway, um, what we're going to do is we're going to let g equals ve be a graph, and we're going to let vertices u and v just be part of the vertex set for g. So we'll say that u and v are neighbors if for some edge e, sorry, if some edge e that connects u and v exists in the edge set. So what that means it's just, you know, they're neighbors if they have an edge connecting them. So there's some vocabulary here. Uh, it's not super important to remember or anything, just the fact that I might use this vocabulary and you'll want to know what that means if I just randomly say one of these. So we'll say that E connects U and V, that U and V are adjacent, and that E is incident to U. And it's also incident to V because E is uh, touching both U and V. So just some important vocabulary there before we get started on the real, the real meat of this uh, video, which is, well, how do we 
talk about walking from edge to edge in a graph. Okay, so we have this term, a walk from vertices v sub 1 to v sub n is just a sequence of vertices v1, v2, all the way through vn, uh, such that every pair of vertices vi and vi plus 1 has some edge vi, vi plus 1, uh, sorry, that exists in E. And now that I think of it, I'm actually going to rename this n to a k. The reason why is because k may not be the same thing as the uh, number of vertices, which we usually associate with n in graph theory. So basically what we have here is we have a sequence of vertices that we're walking along. No notice here that we have an ordered pair, which implies that there is an order to which vertices we're visiting. So we're starting with v1, then going to v2, then going to v3. And uh, the really important condition for a walk is that there has to be an edge v1, v2, and an edge v2, v3, and an edge v3, v4, all the way through to the end. So all of these adjacent vertices have to be connected by edges. So that's what the second part of the definition means. Now, there's nothing saying that there can't be repeated vertices in here. Maybe v1 shows up like somewhere else in there. Uh, maybe it shows up three times, four times, however many times. As long as there's an edge connecting any two adjacent vertices, uh, you can make a walk. So for example, I have v1, v2, v4, v1, v2, v1. You'll notice that it visits v1 three times and v2 twice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace this out. So we start at v1 and we'll go along to v2. And I just I just arbitrarily choose chose one of the edges here. Uh, given that I'm saying uh, v1 goes to v2, there's no spec uh, specificity on what edge we're actually taking. So in this case, you can choose any edge you want. Now I'll go from v2 to v4 along the only edge that we can take from v2 to v4, like so. And then I'll head back to v1 along the only edge again. Now this one says that I want to go from v1 to v2, and again, I can choose any edge. So I want to take a fresh, uh, a fresh edge right here and go along this edge, like so. And then it says to go back to v1. So the only option I have is to take an edge that has already been traveled before. So let's say I just take this edge back. It doesn't matter which one, as long as any, as long as some edge from v1 to v2 happens. So. Something that I want to point out is that you can repeat edges in a walk. You can go visit a vertex any number of times you want in a walk. There's really no restriction to a walk other than the fact that you always have to follow an edge. So other than the fact that you need to follow an edge, you're, you can do really whatever you want with a walk. Okay, so the length of a walk is the number of edges traversed in that specific walk. So note that this isn't the number of unique edges traversed, it's just the number of edges traversed in total. So for example, in this walk, we, tra we traverse one, the edge from V1 to V2, two, uh, the edge from V2 to V4, three, the edge from V4 to V1, four, the edge from V1 to V2, and five, the edge from V2 to V1. So the length of this whole thing is five. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a whole bunch of definitions that basically talk about specific types of walks. And what that means is that basically everything that it makes up a walk, so such as like the fact that all the adjacent edges have to, or vertices have to be connected by an edge, and this whole uh, concept of a length of a walk, all of those are going to apply for each of these uh, different types of walks. So. Make sure you uh, keep that in mind as I go through these next definitions. So the first of those new definitions is a path. So a path is a walk where every vertex is unique, except maybe the first and last vertices may be the same, but otherwise every other vertex is unique. So if we come back to this one, we could do something like, all right, let's say V1, V2, V3 is a path because, you know, we only visit each vertex once. That's fine. Something like v1, v2, v4, v1. 
This is also a path. We're allowed to have V1s on both sides of this. And this is totally fine. In fact, we'll actually talk about a specific type of path that uh, forces you to have the same vertex uh, starting and finishing the path. Something that's not okay is if we do something like V1, V2, V4, V1, V2, V1. Now the problem with this is that, yeah, we have visited uh, V1 at the start and the end of this path, but we also have it in the middle. So that's not okay. Another one that's not okay would be uh, V1, V2, V1, V4. Uh, and that's just because you have V1 twice in here, and the second V1 is not in the last position of the uh, walk, so that's not allowed either. So these two are paths. The other two are not paths. The next type of walk that we have is a trail. So a trail happens to be a walk where the edges are not allowed to repeat. So whereas a path, you can't have the vertices repeat except for the first and last. A trail says that you can't have any edge repeat whatsoever. So we can actually look at this. Let's take a look at v v1, v2, v1, v4. It is possible. So the, this being a multigraph, a graph with uh, possibly multiple edges between two vertices, this makes it a little bit harder to talk about if a uh, walk is a path or isn't a path. But we can talk about if a walk can describe a... Oh, sorry. A trail. I'm so sorry. But yeah, given that there are, say, two edges between V1 and V2, this, we can't specifically say, oh, this is a trail or this isn't a trail. But we can say that, well, this can define a trail. The reason why it can define a trail is, say, we could choose this bottom edge for the first V1, V2, and then choose the top edge for V2, V1. So this can be a trail right here. And in simple graphs, in graphs where there's at most one edge between any two vertices, it'll be a lot easier to say, oh, well, this, uh, this walk is in fact a trail. This one is also a trail. So I'll put that down here as well. I'll put that, this is definitely a trail. This uh, can be a trail. So what we have here is a, a uh, walk that happens to be a path and it also happens to be a trail. Same with this one. This one is a trail as well. And the fact that a vertex is repeating in the trail, it doesn't matter per se. Uh, we are allowed to have repeated vertices in a trail as long as the edges don't repeat. So now this one cannot be a trail. And the reason why it can't be a trail, we travel along from V1 to V2 or from V2 to V1 three times. Once here, once here, and once there. We have three times that we're traversing between these two edges, oh, sorry, between these two vertices, but only two possible edges. So because of that, there's no possible way for us to, um, for us to do that. So this cannot be... a path, or a trail. Similar with this walk right here, it is definitely not a path, it is definitely not a trail. Let's talk about something that could be a trail. If we do v1, v2, v4, v1, v2, v3, v4. If we map out the, uh, if we map out the trail here. We'll start at V1. And by the way, the, uh, there's nothing saying that every walk has to start at V1, just as a heads up. We can we can start our walks anywhere and end them anywhere. I just happen to choose V1 because, you know, that's the way my brain works right now. Anyway, following this, we'll go from V1 to V2. Let's choose this arbitrarily. Now we're going to go to V4. We'll go to V1 then, so I'll take this edge here, and then to V2, I'll, so I'll choose this other edge from V1 to V2 just to avoid disqualifying this walk from being a trail. 
Then we go to V3, like so, and then to V4. So because we haven't touched any of those edges twice, this, in fact, can be a trail. So that's a trail. It's just a walk that doesn't repeat any vertices. Or sorry, that doesn't repeat any edges. And if you think about the Bridges of Konigsberg problem, that's actually what people are looking for, is they're looking for a trail in this graph, uh, I mean, which is the same graph as here. They're, they're looking for a trail, but they want to specifically do a trail that covers all of the edges. So some of these edges, not all these edges are covered. In this one, for example, you can see that V2, V3 is not touched whatsoever. Uh, this V2, V3 at least. So this trail doesn't contain every edge, but it is a trail nonetheless. So we'll talk about trails that cover every edge a little bit later in the video. So then our next definition is a cycle. Now a cycle is specifically a type of path, but it's a path that starts and stops on the same vertex. And that's why we have this exception right here. This, the fact that paths can have the first and last vertices be the same. So that basically a cycle is a path where the first and last vertices are the same, but every are otherwise unique and every other vertex is unique. So this is a path that is not a cycle because it doesn't start and stop at V1. It just starts at V1 and stops at V3. This, however, is a cycle because it starts at V1, it stops at V1, and no vertices are repeated in between. And of course, because this is not a path, it cannot be a cycle. And lastly, we have a circuit. A circuit is a trail that starts and stops on the same vertex. So it can be a little bit confusing to differentiate between a cycle and a circuit. Sometimes even I mess it up. Sometimes even a top level graph theorists will say cycle when they mean circuit, but we're going to specifically say circuit for this time. So we know for sure which one we're talking about. So a circuit happens to be a trail that starts and stops on the same vertex. So this would not be a, a circuit. I'll put that down here. Not a circuit. This one's also not a circuit. Uh, now there is this. But this one can be a circuit. Actually, it definitely is a circuit. So we can put circuit down here. And this one, because it cannot be a trail, it cannot be a circuit. All right, so here are the last special types of walks that we're going to cover in this video, at least. Uh, so we have an Eulerian trail. And that is a trail that traverses every edge of G exactly once. So you can't leave out any edges. You can't use edges more than once, uh, specifically because it's a trail. So an Eulerian trail says, okay, we're going to, it's a trail that covers every single edge. And then there's an Eulerian circuit, which is an Eulerian trail that is a circuit. So it stops and ends at the same vertex along with covering every single edge. So these are named after Euler because these would be, if, if you could find an Eulerian trail, preferably an Eulerian circuit that covers every single, uh, every single edge in the bridges of Konigsberg graph, that means that you found a way to cross every single bridge in Konigsberg without uh, repeating bridges. So that's the problem that Euler set out to face. Now, I think these, a lot of these definitions were made much longer after this uh, problem was solved, but these are basically what he was trying to find. So the problem that we're trying to solve now is, well, how can we conclusively tell whether or not a, uh, a graph is Eulerian or not? And we say that a graph is Eulerian if it contains an Eulerian trail. So how, how do we or sorry, if it contains an Eulerian circuit. So how do we know if a graph is Eulerian or not? Well, it's one thing to be able to say, okay, well, let's just take every single possible trail. And if it's not, if we can't find an Eulerian trail out of every single possible trail, then clearly it can't be, uh, well, then, then we've done our job. And that's, you know, an example of an exhaustive proof. It's not a proof I want to go through, uh, I'll be honest. Because it's, uh, 
it's a really hard way to prove this. Um, so instead, why don't we find a, uh, an easier way to go about it, and we'll follow sort of the logic that Euler did, and, and which will uh, we'll sort of find a connection between the number of edges that a vertex has and whether or not the, the uh, graph has an Eulerian trail. So first we need to do just a few more definitions. I know we've done a, lo a lot in this video, but just a few more definitions and then we'll be able to talk about this problem. Okay, so for this next uh, for this next uh, definition, we're going to again let g equals ve be a graph. We're going to let uh, v be a vertex in the graph's vertex set. So we say that the degree of v in g is the number of edge connections that v has. So I'm specifying edge connections because I want to say that it's not the uh, the number of edges that are connected to v, but specifically the number of edge connections. And you'll see why in a moment. So I have this example graph here, and I want to look at the degree of each vertex. So the way we would actually write that out symbolically is we would say d e g, and I'll put a subscript uppercase g right here so we know that we're saying that this is the degree of the vertex in specifically our graph g, the degree of v sub 1. <clears throat> I'm starting out, actually let's start out with v sub 4 first, that's a little bit easier. There's only one edge connection at v sub 4 right here. So we can say that v sub 4 has a degree of 1 in our graph g. The degree in g of v sub 3, well v sub 3 has, a, I didn't draw this well, v sub 3 has two edge connections here. So the degree here is 2. The degree in g of v sub 2, well, this is going to be 1, 2, and 3, because there are three places where an edge connects to v2. So this will be 3. And then finally, the degree in g of v1 is the tricky one, because v1 has a loop. Now, sometimes people get confused, and they say, okay, well, the degree of v1 is 1, 2, 3, 4, because this loop right here is comprised of one edge. Well, that's the reason why I really like to specify that this is the number of edge connections that V has. Because really, a loop is connected to V, uh, this loop in particular is connected to V1 in two places. So this loop actually adds two to the total, de uh, to the uh, degree of V sub 1. So in total, V sub 1 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, total edge connections. So that's the degree of a vertex in G. And what Euler did when he was looking at the bridges of, Kon of Konigsberg is that he actually found a really strong connection between the degree of vertices in the graph and whether that graph can be Eulerian or not. So let's very quickly try to, uh, let's try to see if we can find an Eulerian trail or Eulerian circuit in here. So what I'm going to do is I'll start off at v sub 1, maybe go to v sub 2, go back to v sub 1, and I'll take this last edge here and then head over to v sub 3. So that clears off all the edges in v sub 1. But we come at a crossroads because we come into V3, we have to leave V3, but no matter which road we take, we can't get back. So that's the problem there. So maybe we uh, take this here and then we're stuck in V2. So this graph, this uh, right here is a trail, but it's not an Eulerian trail. And you'll see that the problem seems to be that V3 happens to have Oh, I totally messed this up. This should be the degree of V3 is 3. I apologize for that. We have that uh, V3 has an odd number of edges here. So once we go, you know, when we're working with an Eulerian trail, we're entering edges and then immediately leaving them a whole bunch. And at some point we kind of get stuck here. So this actually has a lot to do with the uh, court, with the connection that Euler discovered. So let's take a look at that. Now, a quick order of warning. This proof is thick, and I say thick with three C's here, 
uh, God, this, uh, this part of the video is probably going to be outdated really soon. But this is an extremely long and thick proof. I promise you, I am not expecting you to be able to write anything of this uh, caliber anytime soon. What I'm doing is I want to show you an example of what like a, a pretty high-level proof looks like. So, uh, and hopefully you'll learn something really useful from the way that I write a proof like this. Uh, I don't know. And you won't be expected to write anything like this for probably a pretty long time. So just, just put that out there. Don't worry about this. You can sit back, relax, make some popcorn. You know, really just uh, really just enjoy the show, if that's your kind of thing. But do, do watch this, because it is really important. So, once... Uh, there you go, the camera works. The theorem that we're working with is that a connected graph is Eulerian, or a connected graph contains an Eulerian cycle if and only if it contains no vertices of odd degree. The first thing I want to notice is that this is an if and only if proof. So this is a really strong connection. Either both of these are true, a graph is connected, uh, sorry, a connected graph is Eulerian and it has no vertices of odd degree, or this, uh, both of these are false, that it has at least one vertex of odd degree and it is not Eulerian. Uh, I should point out really quick that a connected graph means that every vertex, there, there exists a walk between any two vertices in the graph. So for example, this is a connected graph here because we could get, uh, if I randomly choose two uh, vertices here, let's see, uh, and specifically I mean two distinct vertices. So let's do this. I have my collection of fun dice because yes I am that kind of nerd as well on top of all the other kinds of nerd I can be. Oh gosh, where's the one I'm looking for? This uh, this brief and fun experiment that I did is uh, taking way longer. Okay, there you go. I have a four-sided die. Um, I'm going to randomly choose two numbers here. Okay, so starting at V2, and then going to, and we can't choose V2 again, we want to choose two distinct vertices here, V1. Well, this is easy. We can do a walk from V2 to V1 by following one edge. If we do, let's say, V3 to V4, those are connected by a walk. Uh, let's do something interesting. Let's say V4 to V1, uh, V2, well, we can do a walk from here to here. So because all of these graph, because all these vertices here, you can make a path in between them, or sorry, a uh, walk in between them. This means that this graph is connected. An example of a disconnected graph, let me pull out a spare piece of paper. An example of a disconnected graph would be something like this, where v1, v2, v3, let's say, so let's say we have something like this, and then over here we have v4, v5, v6, V7, or that's going to look like something like that. So we can say that these are all part of one graph G. We're allowed to do this. They, you don't have to have a completely connected graph. So what we have are connected components of the graph G. So V1, V2, V3, these all represent one component, and this all represents another component of G. So this is a disconnected graph. A graph like this is connected. That's basically what we're talking about in this theorem. So again, I know that was kind of a long sidetrack. Basically, a connected graph is Eulerian if and only if it contains no vertices of odd degree. So this is a if and only if proof. We have to prove both directions. We have to apply our uh, biconditional conjunction equivalency and then solve both of those, uh, prove both of those conditionals true. So I chose to do the left side first, or sorry, the backwards direction first, where I'm going to assume that the graph is a ver the uh, graph has no vertices of odd degree, that the degree of all vertices is, are even, and then I'm going to prove that that uh, graph is Eulerian. So, what we can do is we can say, suppose G equals VE is a graph with no vertices of odd degree. And what that means is that no vertices have degree one. So we can actually, we're actually, because of this, we're allowed to create a circuit. Because since no vertices have degree one, we're not going to get trapped anywhere inside of the circuit. So we're guaranteed that 
once we start, once we hit, uh, start a V1 and venture off, we'll always be able to find a path back to V1. So, we'll create our circuit and name it C. This is, C is our uh, circuit V1, V2, all the way up through VK and the V sub 1. Now, we don't necessarily know what VK is, or sorry, what uh, K is. It could be equal to the number of edges. And that's what case one is about. In case one, we accidentally create an Eulerian circuit just by sort of following edges that we haven't traveled across before. Then G is Eulerian. That's perfect. We're done. Case two, on the other hand, is the case where we don't make an Eulerian circuit. We just have some circuit that only covers some of the edges. Well, if C isn't Eulerian, then we know for sure that there's at least one vertex such that one of its edges is not included in C. So we'll call that vertex V sub i. And because C is a circuit and no vertex has odd degree, what that means is that if V sub i has one free edge, well, it must also have an additional free edge. Otherwise, uh, v would either V would have a ver like would have an odd number of edges connected to it, or C would not be a, a circuit because it, uh, I don't know, it only travels across, say, three of these edges. That's not possible because uh, you always have to go into V and out of V in a circuit. So because we have two, uh, we have two edges, at least that are not included in C in our V sub I here, we can actually construct a new circuit. So that's what I'm doing right here. I'm constructing a new circuit, V sub i, that then goes to vertex u1, u2, all the way through ul, and back to V sub i, such that no edge in this new circuit is contained in V. So some of these vertices here, u, u1, u2, all the way through ul, they might be equal to some of the vertices in here. That's totally fine. We're, we're allowed to do that. The thing we're not allowed to do is have an edge in here that also happens in here. So we're going to say that we can do that by construction. And again, this is possible because no vertices have odd degree. Then what we'll do is we'll let C prime be the circuit where we start at V1 and we'll follow the path, uh, the, sorry, the trail that the circuit, the, this original circuit C made all the way up to VI. But then we branch off into our new circuit. So we'll travel to U1, U2, all the way up through UL and then go back to VI and finish the uh, trail that the original circuit made all the way back to VK and then V1. So what we're doing is we're inserting our new circuit into the old circuit to build a larger circuit. And what we have is a larger circuit that may or may not be Eulerian. So if it's Eulerian, then we're good. We'll just apply case one here. Uh, otherwise, we'll just keep on applying case two. So we'll find new edges that haven't been visited, we'll build new circuits, and then uh, check if it's Eulerian again. And the way we know it's Eulerian is if we've visited all of the edges in the graph, and that we just know that by, based on the size. If this k equals the size of the edge set, then we're good. So yeah, we'll just keep on doing this whole process in case two until we create an Eulerian circuit, and all of that is possible because we've assumed that g has no vertices of odd degree. So I'm happy to talk about this process as much as uh, you all want. I know it's I, I kind of gave a very high level overview of this process, but this is actually what we do if we are in a graph and we want to figure out, okay, well, does this uh, can, can we construct an Eulerian circuit from this graph? Well, basically, I mean, first we'll check if it contains no vertices of odd degree, and then we'll just start building circuits in the graph, willy nilly, and combining them together. Anyway, so yeah, that's the backwards direction of this proof. And then here's the forwards direction. It takes up an entirely separate page of the uh, paper right here. I actually struggled fitting this on one front to back piece of printer paper, so I'm proud of that. So what we're going to do here is suppose G is Eulerian. We want to prove that it has no vert vertices of odd degree, but I'm going to do a proof by contradiction here. So my assumptions are that G is Eulerian and seeking a contradiction that at least one vertex has odd degree. So I've set up this Eulerian circuit that we know exists because we've assumed G is Eulerian. So that circuit's going to be V1, V2, all the way through Vm and V1, where in this case M is the size of the edge set. That's a fun little fact. Um, 
uh, we're going to let this be an Eulerian circuit in G. And we'll further let V be one of these vertices in G such that the degree is odd. And because we know that the degree is odd, I'm just going to say that the degree of V equals 2K plus 1, where K is an integer by definition of odd. So V is one of our special edges. Uh, sorry, special vertices that has an odd degree. We'll note that V has to appear in C 2K plus 1 times, and that's because C traverses over every single edge. Oh, sorry, not 2K plus 1 times. It, would, uh, it just appears in C multiple times. So what we'll do is we'll let I be the index of V's first appearance in C. Uh, in C, yeah. So... If, you know, if we're traveling V1, V2, all the way up through, and then we come across some VI, where that VI happens to be equal to our special V. That's what I is going to be, is the first time we see our special V in the circuit. What we'll also do is we'll let the set containing E1, E2, all the way up through E sub 2K plus 1, these will be the edges incident to V. So all of these edges are contained in here. I've arbitrarily numbered them. And we can say that without loss of generality, since C is Eulerian, we're just going to suppose that C traverses all of these edges in this specific order. Or at the very least, that we numbered E sub 1, E sub 2, all the way through E sub 2, K plus 1, in the order that they appear in our circuit. So this just makes our life a lot easier. And I can say without loss of generality, specifically because the specific edges that are connected to V, the ordering of those edges doesn't actually matter for the logic of the proof. So that's that's why I'm saying without loss of generality here. Specifically because I could make um, basically 2k plus 1 factorial cases that deals with each individual ordering of these edges, but they'd all have the same logic. So I'm saving myself a lot of work here, basically. Okay, so now I have uh, two actual cases here that I'm going to use. In the first case, i is greater than 1. And what that means is that v is not equal to v sub 1 here. So c does not start at v. It starts at some other vertex, and then only later does it enter into v. So what we have is that c first enters v through edge e1, and it must immediately leave through edge e2. The reason why I'm saying e1 and e2 is because we defined e1 and e2 to be the first and second edges of that are connected to V in the cycle, respectively. The reason why C has to enter through V and then immediately leave through V again is because V isn't the first uh, vertex in the cycle. So only the you can only permanently sort of quote unquote permanently leave V one and then permanently enter V one, if that makes sense. Um, Basically, what we're doing is we're creating two pairs of edges, E1, E2, E3, E4, all the way through E2, K minus 1, through E2, K, which means that C enters through E1 and exits through E2, then it enters through E3 and exits through E4, and eventually it will do that for every single pair until it enters through E2, K plus, or 2, K minus 1, and exit through E2, K. So those are... Those pairs represent all the times C enters and leaves V. What that means is that because C is Eulerian, it covers every single edge, so it must enter V through E2K plus 1. However, since it has basically burned all the other edges, because, uh, because C cannot exit through any more of these edges, given that it's already touched them before, well, C must end at V, because otherwise uh, it, would, it would be traveling across an edge that is already seen. And that's going to be our contradiction right here, because C is a circuit, and because V, it didn't start at V, it started at V1, which is a completely different vertex, well, C has to end at V sub 1. So the contradiction there is that C cannot end at V, because uh, C cannot end at V here, it must end at V sub 1, so, V basically cannot have an odd number of edges, edges connected to it, otherwise this is a problem. So that's one of the contradictions that we'll find, and that contradiction appears in this case where V is not the start of the circuit, basically. 
But what we still need to do is we need to point out the contradiction that happens when i equals 1, which basically means that v is the start of the circuit. So what happens then is that c starts at v and it leaves immediately through edge e1, which is how we defined our edges right here. Once, v, uh, once c then leaves through e1, we construct pairs sort of like we did last time, except this time it's, it's entering through e2 and leaving through e3, then entering through e4 and leaving through e5, all the way up until it enters through e2k and leaves through e2k plus 1. So then after c leaves through, uh, oh sorry, this should say e2k plus 1, after c leaves through edge uh, e2k plus 1, it can never return to v again, so it has to end at some other vertex. Um, the problem there is that v has to uh, be the start and end of this circuit. And we can't just not take e2k plus 1 so that we can end at so that we can end at v because, well, we have to touch every single edge in the circuit. That's because the circuit is Eulerian. So that's our contradiction there, is that if v is the start of the circuit and it has an odd number of edges, well, that's a problem because it is no longer able to then finish at v. So in both cases, we have a contradiction. So therefore, the forward direction of this has to be true. So therefore, because I've shown both sides, G is Eulerian if and only if all of G's vertices have an even degree. So that's the end of the proof of this theorem. Something that's, I think, really notable about this is that this is the first proof that I've shown where you can't show just one side of this and then say that the other follows by symmetry. You'll see that I use vastly different logic for this part of the proof than I did for this part. So we can't really do a symmetric argument here, is the problem. Uh, the other thing is that this is a very high-level graph theoretical proof. Um, and it's actually relatively rare to see a, a direct proof used in a graph whatsoever. Um, that being said, uh, most of the graph-based proofs that we're going to use have to do, like are direct proofs, but once you get into more advanced stuff, it's more likely that you'll see proofs by contradiction, like what I did here. Where you're saying, suppose the graph uh, doesn't have this property, then what? And then show that it's impossible. So uh, if you continue in your studies on graph theory, and I highly hope that you do continue in your studies in graph theory, you'll see a lot more proofs by contradiction. And often those proofs by contradiction will be pretty fluid, like I believe that this one is. All right, so the last thing we need to do to really find a solution to the seven bridges of Koenigsberg problem is... We need to handle the fact that, well, what if a graph contains an Eulerian trail? So Euler figured out another theorem, which is that a connected graph G contains an Eulerian trail if and only if it has zero or two vertices of odd degree. That's exactly two, zero or exactly two vertices of odd degree. It can have three, four, five, etc. Either zero or either two. So this is another if and only if proof. I will uh, start off by looking at the uh, backwards direction again. Now the reason why we say G contains an Eulerian trail if and only if it has zero or two vertices of odd degree is just because an Eulerian circuit also counts as an Eulerian trail. So what I'm doing right here is I'm allowing for us to talk about trails of all kinds where this case is an Eulerian circuit and this case is an Eulerian trail that isn't a circuit. So what I have here is, for the backwards direction, I'm starting off with a very informal sort of proof by cases, but I feel comfortable not making this a explicitly a proof by cases because this part is very trivial. All we're saying here is that if G has zero vertices of odd degree, then the previous theorem just tells us that it has an Eulerian circuit, and a circuit is a trail, so that's fine. So now we're going to look at only the case where G has two vertices of odd degree. We'll call those two vertices u1 and u2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an edge in between u1 and u2. So add a completely new edge. And it doesn't matter if u1 and u2 already have edges connecting them. I'm adding just a, a new edge altogether. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying let g prime be the graph that has all the same vertices as g and all the same edges as g, but it also has a new edge, and I should put parentheses around here, u1 and u2. 
So, since the degree of, v of u1 and u2 in g are both odd, their degree and g prime are even. So what this means is that the only two vertices with odd degree in g have even degree in g prime, which means that all vertices in g prime are have even degree. So the previous theorem says that there's an Eulerian circuit in g prime, which we're going to call uh, c equals u1, v1, v2, all the way through vk, u2, and then u1. I'm being very uh, explicit with this uh, definition here. Or I guess maybe not explicit is the right word, but what I'm, it is possible for u1 and u2 to show up anywhere in here, just as a reminder, as long as we don't um, repeat any of our edges. So these aren't necessarily the only two places where u1 and u2 show up, but what's important is that we have this outgoing edge from u1, this incoming edge to u2, and then our new edge, u2 to u1. So we're going to say that this is a circuit, and we're actually allowed to construct this Eulerian circuit. The reason why is because an Eulerian circuit has all the edges in the graph in it, so we can really order the, uh, we can set an order of the um, edges that we traverse in a circuit by saying, okay, well, let's say, you know, we, we have this, this, we have this one circuit. Um, let's say specifically we travel along that circuit by starting at U1 and ending at the u2 to u1 edge. That's totally possible for us to do. Anyway, so what this means is that by the way we defined g prime, by a construction of g prime, all of these edges in C do exist in G, except for the special u2, u1 edge, or u1, u2 edge. The order in this case doesn't matter because it's undirected. But all these edges, except for our special edge here, exist in G. So thus, we can make an Eulerian trail that includes all of these edges, but then removes this last edge from u2 to u1 here. So we have, a, we have our Eulerian trail that we're able to prove exists by adding this last edge here. And then the proof of the other direction follows through a symmetric argument. We can say that, well, if g has an Eulerian circuit, then it has zero vertices of odd degree. That's by the previous theorem. Then, otherwise, what we'll do is we'll take some Eulerian trail, we'll add an edge between the start and final vertex, and all of a sudden we have an Eulerian circuit, so everything has an uh, even degree. So then, yeah, thus, uh, G cont contains an Eulerian trail if and only if it has zero or two vertices of odd degree. So let's come back to the problem that started it all. Uh, let me come back to the original problem that started it all right here. So this drawing here. We can look at the degree of all of these vertices. So the degree of V1 in the, in the Koenigsberg's bridges problem. This has one, two, three vertex connections. The degree of V2 has one, two, three, four, five connections, so that, that degree is 5. Already, as soon as we know this, we know that there's no Eulerian circuit. So, you know, there's no way you're going to start and end on the same side. But the thing we can also notice is that, well, the degree of V3 has one is 1, 2, 3. So once we are here, we know that there's also no Eulerian trail. And just for a fun exercise, we can also say that the degree of V4 equals 3. So, by proving these two facts right here, oh, this uh, Eulerian trail theorem and this Eulerian circuit theorem right here, Euler, con uh, Euler conclusively proved that the bridges of Konigsberg problem has no solution, that there is no way to traverse all of these bridges exactly once. So yeah, that is the end of probably the most famous graph theory problem ever, one of the really cool graph theory problem. Like, you know, cool being that it's the original problem. Um, and also the end of the video where I get to talk about two of my favorite graph theory proofs ever. These are a lot of fun to work with. I especially, I really love the, the cool logic of us um, talking about this theorem here, where we get to have a graph 
with uh, only two vertices of odd degree, and then we get to add one edge, and bam, all of a sudden it has a uh, Eulerian circuit, and then we remove that edge, and no, well, we know it has an Eulerian trail now. I love proofs like this. They they really they really are a fun time. So I really enjoy it a lot. So yeah, uh, I know this video is pretty long. Um, it is actually really late as I'm recording this. It is uh, 1 32 a.m. And I have to be awake at 6 a.m. for uh, so I can teach you all at 7 on Tuesday the uh, 28th. So I, I will be... I, I apologize, I guess, posthumously for being sleepy in class, but yeah, I don't know. I really love talking about this stuff. This is a really fun video for me, and I, I really love graph theory, so please ask me any questions about graph theory. Um, I'm happy to talk about things like my thesis. I'm especially happy to, uh, you know, introduce you to my advisor, who is probably the graph theory person on campus. She's like, all of everything she does is graph theory, all of the classes that she teaches. She manages to sneak a little bit of graph theory in there. So anyway, yeah, it's cool stuff. Sorry for rambling at the very end. Um, have a wonderful day and thank you for watching.